Anne and I are here today to talk about the cardiovascular system and we're going to be using the cadaver. So first of all, we're going to strip away the skeleton to reveal the heart. The cardiovascular system is composed of the heart, the blood vessels and blood. Our body cells are surrounded by fluid. The fluid that fills the narrow gaps between the cells is called interstitial fluid. And in order to survive and function properly, our cells need a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients and the removal of waste products. The maintenance of this stable internal environment is called homeostasis. So let's look at how the cardiovascular system actually contributes to healthy cellular function. What we know is that the heart is designed to propel blood through the vessels and pumps about five litres of blood to the lungs every minute and the same amount to the rest of the body. This is a massive 14,000 litres of blood through your body every day. So now we're just going to look at the location and the size of the heart. The heart is about the size of your fist and averages about 300 grams in weight. And the heart contains four chambers, two atria at the top section of the heart and two ventricles at the bottom of the heart. This diagram shows approximately where you would find the left atrium and the right atrium, the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Because we're unable to strip down through this uh, picture of the heart, we've brought a model of the heart with us. So as you can see on the model, here's um, an image of the atria and then down here is an image of the ventricles. And these structures here are valves and these long skinny projections are called chordae tendinae. Now if you look at the shape of the heart, you can see that it has a sort of pointed narrow end here and this is called the apex of the heart. And then at the top, the heart is more flat and broad and that's called the base of the heart. And then I'm going to ask Anne if she could tell us why it's important for nurses to know and locate the apex of the heart. So the apex of the heart is actually located in the fifth intercostal space. We've showing you the ribs here so you can identify the intercostal spaces. One, two, three, four, five. And it's at that point in the midclavicular line, which is the centre in the nipple line, where you'll find that apex and you're going to use your stethoscope and place that over the apex of the heart. The reason that you might do that is if the patient has a very fast, a weak or an irregular pulse and when you're actually taking the pulse you can't always feel that and be sure of what the pulse rate is. So in that instance we use the stethoscope on the apex of the heart. Thank you Anne. The next structure that we're going to look at is the pericardium. The pericardium is a triple layered sac that coats the heart. There's the three layers. There's an outer fibrous layer called the fibrous pericardium, which is made up of um, inelastic connective tissue. Then there's two further layers, and those two layers are made of a more delicate uh, serous membrane. The outer membrane is called the parietal membrane, and that one is adhered to the fibrous pericardium. And then there's an inner serous membrane, which is called the visceral um, membrane. And this one is the one that's coating the inside um, or around the heart. In between those two layers, the visceral and the parietal layer, is a very thin layer of fluid. And that stops the two layers from um, rubbing against each other. I'm just going to mention about pericarditis. That's when there is a lack of fluid between that parietal and visceral layer and it causes this friction and rubbing and it sets up an inflammation in the heart and that's known as pericarditis. The other condition occurs when fluid builds up between the parietal and the visceral layer. That can be due to some trauma or bleeding between those layers and as that builds up it starts compressing on the heart and it can cause so much pressure that it actually can stop the heart beating. That condition is known as cardiac tamponade and it is life-threatening. Now we're going to look at the structure of the heart wall. The heart wall is composed of three layers. So on the outside is the epicardium, then there's the myocardium and then the endocardium. The epicardium is made up of delicate connective tissue. 
The uh, middle layer is the myocardium. The myocardium is made up of striated muscle and those striated muscles are long columns of filaments and it is the striations on the muscle that gives the heart its contractility. It gives it a capacity to contract and pump blood out around the body. And the myocardium is special because it's under involuntary control, which means that it's contracting and beating as it's being stimulated by the sinoatrial node, which is what gives us our resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute. On the inside of the heart is the endocardium, and this is made up of an epithelial layer of, uh, of cells and tissue, and that tissue extends into the blood vessels. So Julie, why is it that the walls of the left ventricle are actually larger than the walls of the right ventricle? Yes, well if you look at the structure of the heart here, you can visibly see that this left ventricle is so much thicker. It's about two to four times thicker than the right ventricle. And the reason is, is that this ventricle is the one that's pumping blood out to the rest of the body. So it has to pump at a much greater force to get the blood to move around the body. Whereas uh, from the um, right ventricle, the right ventricle is pumping blood around into the pulmonary circulation. That blood is going to the lungs to be oxygenated and therefore there's not the same greater force that's required for this ventricle to pump. But the problem is, is that over time, if the left ventricle is overworked, i.e. it's got pressure to work against, as in the case of high blood pressure, then this uh, wall can actually get super thickened and the person can end up with heart failure. Um, another important structure to be aware of is the aorta. As you can see, um, the left side of the heart is the one that's pumping out to the body and you can see that the blood is going to go out through this structure here, the aorta, and you can see that there's little um, vessels here that is taking the blood up to the top of the body or up to the brain, but also the aorta curves around and travels down through the centre of the body and then it actually splits or bifurcates and goes and travels down both legs. The aorta is the vessel that's taking all of the blood from the, from the left ventricle out to the body. The final structures that we're going to talk about now is the valves. The valves of the heart. As each chamber of the heart contracts, it pushes a portion of the blood into the ventricle or out of the heart into the circulation. So as you can see, this is the left side of the heart and the valve here is called the mitral valve. And over here is the right side and this is called the tricuspid valve. And this is so called because it has three separate flaps. And then what you can see from the valve is these very uh, stringy-like projections and these are called the chordae tendinae and their job is to prevent the heart from overstretching and it means that the valves um, allow the blood to flow from the atria, the top chambers of the heart, into the ventricles which are the lower chambers of the heart and then there's actually no backflow. In this final image what you can see is you can see the body's circulation. Earlier on we spoke about how the cardiovascular system is, is composed of the heart and the blood vessels and the blood. This diagram shows you how um, the blood is traveling around the entire body. So you can see the heart here, and you can see the aorta, and you can see how the aorta is sending oxygenated blood upwards to the head. But you can also see how it's traveling down through the body and how this uh, vessel splits, and the word for that is bifurcates. This is a, a bifurcation of the aorta and all the oxygenated blood is being carried through these arteries which are um, depicted here in red. So this is your arterial vessels. And then you can see deoxygenated blood coming back from the body and is going back to the heart to be oxygenated via the respiratory system or via the lungs and that's being carried in the veins. So the heart itself has its own circulation, the coronary circulation. So it has blood vessels, the coronary arteries, and the coronary veins that actually supply the heart with its own circulation because it is a muscle itself. And this blood supply feeds those muscles and keeps your heart going. If there is a clot that actually forms in any of these vessels, that can cause a heart attack. It's really important as nurses that we understand this network of coronary blood vessels.